We have some coaching changes to talk about, and we will begin our position evaluation this week on the Wandering Buffalo podcast. You are now listening to the Wandering Buffalo podcast with your hosts, Justin Goddard and Andrew Chang. Bills Mafia, welcome in, and thank you again for joining me on this week's episode of the Wandering Buffalo podcast. Uh, show brought to you by the Buffalo Fan Base Podcast Network. Um, we are brought to you by 26 Shirts. Been talking about 26 Shirts for quite some time now. If you haven't done so, um, check out what they got. Tons of cool designs, and you know it's always going towards a good cause. They're doing tons of good work in the community. Um, so make sure you're checking it out. Um, this is going to be kind of our first off-season uh, episode. Uh, apologize for missing last week, kind of. Needed that little decompression, take a step away from from the team with the season ending and just kind of reset the focus from the regular season moving into the off season and honestly not not completely there yet, you know, with the Super Bowl still to be played and you know, it, it's still kind of feeling like football season. Um but hey, seven, eight years ago we would have been starting this process somewhere in like just after Thanksgiving. So uh, grateful that, you know, it's the first week of February and, and we're only crossing this bridge now. A um, couple things happened since the season ended. Um, some coaching changes. Um, we did see Joe Brady lock down the um, full-time offensive coordinator position, um, which was something that I was very excited for. Um Thought he did a great job to to finish out the season in a really tough spot, right? Taking over for Ken Dorsey, you know, what, six weeks into the season, seven weeks, um, and just kind of having to operate with somebody else's playbook and, and tinker as he went. Um, what I liked most about Joe Brady through throughout the remainder of the season, uh, it. I'm not even going to get into the X's and the O's of the play calling or anything like that. What I really liked about Joe Brady through the remainder of the season was just kind of his, his low recognition of the game. Um, and just like having having timely play calls and, you know, seeing in games where if the run game was working, he stayed committed to the run game. It wasn't this like need to pass. Um, you know, if we were just play after play running into a brick wall, um, wasn't afraid to pivot away from that. So I, I think overall the flow and the feel for how the game was going was, was the biggest piece that I felt was kind of different from Dorsey. Um, I feel like Dorsey had a bit of, uh, I drew up these really good plays on paper and uh, planned on using them. So things aren't what we expected, but, but we're going to do them anyways. Um, and we, we saw an immense difference in what the offense looked like. And the biggest thing for me was I heard a lot of talk before this hire of, you know, Josh Allen endorsed Joe Brady and it was, well, Josh Allen endorsed Ken Dorsey, and we saw how that went, and blah, blah, blah. I think this one, this one to me is a bit different. Um, I think there's a, a a level of maturity change in Josh Allen, uh, just with it not being a huge time difference, but knowing the difference between, you know, this is my buddy that I want to see get a job um, versus what the success actually was, and for how much Josh Allen and Dorsey were buddies and for how much, you know, they love each other as people. Uh, the biggest, most important change that I saw from Dorsey to Joe Brady was Allen looked like a completely different player. And I'm not just saying on the field, you know, with his throws, anything like that. He looked like he was having fun again. And, there were so many instances in the beginning of the season where he just kind of looked melancholy and kind of humdrum. And he was talking in post games about this low positive Aaron Rodgers sound and stuff. And then, you know, we, we saw him on the sidelines throughout the season, 
the you know obviously the viral clip going out there saying how he feels like he's back we'll we'll spare the expletives for right now um but yeah just overall the offense had more energy more juice under under Brady so that was something I was really excited about and then speaking of bringing the juice um on the defensive side of the ball um the Bills per promoted uh, Bobby Babich to the defensive coordinator position. And that's the first thing I hear about this dude. Um, just this energy that he brings. Um, glowing reviews from the players. We've heard Hoyer, Hyde, um, this year Dodson talk about him. And I think this is a super interesting promotion because for starters, it's the guy that I wanted to get the job. Uh, I think everything he's touched on the defense has been great. Um, he was originally the safeties coach. Obviously, we've had some fantastic safeties. He moved to linebacker coach. We've had great play out of our linebackers. And, you know, you can partially say that's to do with the players themselves. Um, but we're also talking about late round draft picks and, Hoyer and Hyde kind of being like cast offs from other teams and Milano's a fifth round pick and you know even Tremaine Edmonds being a high pick had his best career had his best year um under Babbage. We see Bernard, you know, that being kind of the biggest question for a lot of people going into this season. Uh, you know, you're gonna let Edmonds walk, what's the plan? And I won't speak for everybody. I had tremendous amounts of concerns about Bernard coming in and filling those shoes. And it, he so far, you know, exceeded my expectations. Like if I drew up on paper, what I wanted out of my linebacker, he, he exceeded that. So um, just have to give some of the credit to the coaching, obviously some of it to the players, but when we're going to blame coaches all the time, or when it doesn't look good, they got to get some credit. It can't just be it can't just be the players when things go good and the coaches when it's bad. Um, and honestly, kind of the, the the biggest glowing endorsement for him for me um, coming out of this past season was Terrell Dodson, um, who's been a guy who's been around the Bills for a number of years now, and he's always kind of been this special teams reserve depth guy and you know unfortunately due to some some bad injury luck that we had to deal with Dodson got a ton of run this year and honestly it it wasn't even kind of like this glaring weak spot on the defense I think there's games that he had a really positive impact and overall I would say like at worst we were getting you know a net neutral from him um so that kind of that kind of speaks to the coaching and the positions that these players were being put in. Um, that a guy that's been around the team for it's five six years now um, hasn't really done anything was thrust into the starting lineup and didn't. I mean, he he wasn't blowing plays out of the water constantly, but you didn't have this tremendous drop off, um, despite how high of a level. Uh, our linebacks were, were playing at. Um, so I think that says a lot about Babbage. And what I find interesting about this is, I guess what kind of happens behind the scenes of the number one reason I wanted to promote Babbage is I, I felt like if it didn't happen this year, uh, I thought he had earned it and I thought he was going to get looks from other teams. Um, that spot obviously being open unless McDermott was going to continue doing it. Um, I thought overall McDermott did a good job as a defensive coordinator, um, but also something that I, I wanted him to be able to take a step back from that and you know have his input on the defense, but still be able to kind of step back and just be the head coach again. Um, so happens this offseason that Babbage starts getting you know offers for a defensive coordinator position. And I think the major thing for me is, you know, were there discussions behind closed doors of, is he going to be able to, you know, implement his own ideas 
Um, is he going to be the defensive play caller on game day? Um, and I have to think that at least some of that power is going to be given to him because it doesn't make much sense for me for for him to to have stayed in Buffalo if he's not going to have those opportunities. Um, there would be a myriad of opportunities outside of Buffalo that would be a better opportunity to advance his career. And I, I look at this kind of as like uh, just kind of the example in general, not you know the names or the people or anything. Um, but Eric Bieniemy in Kansas City, and for so long he was this this hot head coaching name, and you know year after year just wasn't getting head coaching opportunities. You know he would interview, but not get offered the job. And you know this is where I'm just using kind of the the situation and not the person excel. Um, I've heard maybe Bieniemy is not a great interview, blah blah blah, all that. Um, but so much so that. You know, is it Biennemi? Is it Reed? Is it Mahomes? That he kind of had to do a lateral move to kind of show, like, you know, hey, I do know what I'm doing, um, because those the coaches, the player, um, the situation has kind of started to be what what the credit was going toward towards rather than Biennemi. Um, so I see a very similar situation in Buffalo. Um, whereas if I don't think. I feel like if he wasn't being given those opportunities to call plays to run a defense, um, that it probably would have been adios to Babbage. And, you know, this isn't to say that McDermott is going to have nothing to do with the defense anymore. He's the head coach. He has something to do with every facet of the team. Um, and I don't think that it's going to be this, like, stark difference of, of what the defense will look like. We go back and Bobby Babbage has been working. His time working with McDermott goes back to 2011. Um, there's some gaps in there, um, whatnot. But, I mean, we're talking these dudes were first working together going on 13 years ago. Um, so there's familiarity with each other. There's got to be some sort of cohesive uh, agreeing on philosophies or it just wouldn't be continuing to work. Um, so there was a lot of things that I liked about McDermott's defense last year. And I think some of that's, um, going to be carrying over. So really excited about that hire as well. Um, as of right now, Matthew Smiley is still on as the special teams coordinator. I don't really see that changing at this point. I, I think it, I think it would have changed by now if it was going to. And honestly, I, I can be okay with this. He he was responsible for, you know, coaching tops of the league, uh, special teams, you know, going back two, three years ago. Um, this this past season of having, you know, some poor, poor, poor performances, excuse me, um, is kind of like the exception at this point. Um so there's a lot that I would like to see change with special teams, um, but I, I don't necessarily think that he needs to go. Um, I think this is a team that likes to really invest in the special teams and has special teams only type players, and I'm okay with that to an extent. I think we also need to get younger in those types of positions, and you need to have draft picks that can contribute in that way. Um because some of these guys that we've we've had as like these special teams only guys, um, they're getting up there. Um, they've been around doing it for a while, and if you're gonna have a lot of money tied up in a few positions on the roster, um, you got to kind of have those those late round draft picks, like mid late mid to late round draft picks, be able to contribute on special teams. Um, you can't have all this money tied up. So I, I think there there does need to be a, a bit of a change there. Um, as far as kind of the cast goes, I'm okay with Smiley being back. I wasn't really expecting him to be gone um, just for how much like game day management stuff he does with McDermott. He's kind of the right-hand right, man, right hand man. Um, whether or not he deserved to go for that alone, that's a whole nother debate. Um, 
but I didn't really expect him to be gone, and, and it looks like he's going to stick around. Um, I think he got a lot of things thrown his way for some things that were kind of out of his control at the end of the year. Um, I, I think Tyler Bass got, you know, kind of a case of the yips at the worst time of the season. Um, they had ended up being, you know, by far his worst season as a pro. Um, and this is one of the things where, where, like I said, we, we love to blame the coaches when things are going poorly and it's the players when they're great. I think this is kind of something where we we got to put some of it on the player here as well. And hopefully we can get that whatever was going on um, out of Bass's system because, you know, he's he's got a contract that he just signed and he's got some guaranteed money going forward. So I'd imagine that he's going to be back next season. So, you know, maybe maybe this is the case for you know, Matthew Smiley keeping his job. Maybe he's got something up his sleeves to uh, help Tyler Bass get right. Um, but yeah, that's the coaching changes Changes for now. Um, there were some more positional moves uh, made along the way. We're going to get into that more as we kind of explore the position groups um, and get kind of more in-depth with it there. Um, but that's your changes at offensive coordinator uh, and defensive coordinator. I'm going to take a quick break. When I come back, we want to start the positional review um, before we head into free agency. Stick around. Hey, this is Brother Bill. Now back to the show. Welcome back in, and thank you again for joining me on this week's episode of the Wandering Buffalo podcast. If you've made it this far in the show, I do ask you to do me a huge favor. Um, like, share, subscribe, text a friend about a show you're listening to. Um, just helps spread the word a little bit, makes it a lot easier to keep these episodes out, um, every week. Um, and a little programming note here, we are going to be kind of transitioning into Wednesday releases, um, just logistically being, uh, a little bit easier for all the pieces involved. Um, if you're subscribed, it won't matter because you're still going to get the notification. If you're not subscribed... Go ahead and hit that button so so you're going to get the update whenever we're dropping an episode. Um, so I want to kind of dive into just a little bit of a positional review. This kind of just broad strokes. Um, before we head into free agency, just kind of seeing where we stand at each position. Um, what I personally would like to see changed. Um, things of that nature. Um, I'm going to keep this... Like I said, broad stroke. I'm not going to bore everybody with the stats, year over year comparisons. Um, we all watched the season. We all know like what we saw out there. Um, kind of just going over what these players look like going forward, contract situations, and things of that nature. Um, I'm going to break this into um, different position groups per week, um, just as there's kind of this slow part of the year for us. Um, I wanted to start out week one with the quarterback and running back. Um, quarterback, super easy to cover. Um, you got the man, the myth. Um, Josh Allen obviously had another great year, despite it not feeling like it at times. Um, another year where, especially in the beginning of the year, where we were putting up these McDonald's numbers, but it, it just didn't feel right. Um, I think towards the tail end of the season, it, it started feeling like that more dangerous offense again. Um, obviously, he's not going anywhere. We love that. He's been great. I'll sign up for another 10 years of that. Um, backup quarterback was Kyle Allen. This is um, this continues to be kind of a hard spot for me to evaluate because very fortunately we haven't really seen Josh miss, miss a ton of time um, since I believe it was his rookie year with the with the shoulder sprain um, maybe it was his second year um, but we bring in these backup quarterbacks and I get excited or upset about it whatever the case is and then we don't really ever see them play so I don't I never know how right or wrong I was, and I, I like to know that. Um, 
Kyle Allen, I liked having him in the building just with the relationship that he has with Josh. Um, I think it's super important at this point in Josh's career that to me, it's not so much about like the veteran in the room or anything like that, you know, helping him break down defenses and all that. That's Josh now. Um, I don't think he really needs that guy anymore. I think it's more just, you know, the just the guys in the room during practice, you know, the whole vibe of it. The And that's why I'm cool with, you know, Kyle Allen being there, even if he's really only there because he's buddies with Josh Allen. Um, but he is a free agent this season. My plan here would be a fully different approach than what we've been doing. And honestly, I think we have enough of a track record right now of how Bean's done it. And it's kind of worked out just fine for him because we haven't had to lean on any of these guys. Um, but uh, I'm sorry, Bean has been kind of cool with rolling out one year deals to guys and just, you know, it seeming to me seems like he has a few guys that he's willing to target. And it's kind of, you know, as, as these higher priced backups go throughout the league that like, you know, might get a chance to start or kind of like the bridge quarterbacks are going for a team that might be taking a rookie quarterback. He kind of like takes the one that's left over from there and gets them on a cheap deal. And hopefully we don't really have to see them play for me. I would love to see just a, a late round pick with a guy with some physical tools, you know, fifth, sixth, seventh round, something like that. We kind of did that with Jake Fromm a few years back and, he didn't end up sticking around for very long. Um, but just, I'm not, I'm not talking about a guy that's ever really going to be pushing for Josh Allen or anything. Um, I want to see one of these guys with just like some sort of tremendous physical ability. And, you know, they go in the seventh round because they didn't have a cannon arm or they're not super accurate, but they're, you know, an athletic freak. And, on the on the chance that Josh Allen ever goes down, you at least have this kind of type of variance that you can throw throw at a team. Um, if you're running the standard Bills offense and Kyle Allen has to come into the game, it's not going to look the same anyways. Um, so, I, for me, I would love to see you know a curveball be in play if if it comes down to it. And um, I think about a guy like. Um, Oh, his name's slipping me right now. He's the the backup in Baltimore, um, where a couple of years ago Lamar goes down and he comes into the game. I think it was Huntley, um, and Lamar goes down. And it's all of a sudden like, oh hey, man, they're about to be cooked. And then dude comes in. He's this physical freak, and um, you know, didn't quite look the same as what Lamar was doing out there, but was able to move the offense in a different way. And and that's kind of what I'm looking for out of this position. And then it's, it also has the benefit of this is this can become a position that we don't have to talk about every year of do we have to make a change here or whatever. I don't need the guy to be a superstar in the making. Just give me a, a backup quarterback on a rookie deal that can be around Allen, learning from Allen, learning the system. You know, just always preparing to to go in if they have to, and and just give me some continuity in that room. If you want to keep a guy like Kyle Allen, you know, it was Matt Barkley for a while. You know, somebody to just be in the room with Josh. That's fine. Um, give me it as his quarterbacks coach. Give me it as the third stringer that's going to be on the practice squad all year, and probably won't ever see them, but they get to be around Josh in the building and in the meeting rooms, all that. Um, for a guy that has the possibility of playing at some point, um, I would love this to be something where we don't have to have whatever three, four million dollars tied up in the backup quarterback. Like I said, kind of a late round flyer on somebody with some tools that you can have in the building for a while. Um, so we'll see what happens there. Um, and then the running back position. This one is going to be 
it's going to be an interesting group for me um, because I think we're going to see a a ton of shakeup here. Um, Obviously, we saw James Cook really emerge this year. He was absolutely tremendous, super fun to watch. Um, The only other guy under contract right now is Naheem Hines. Obviously missed all of last year with the knee injury from free jet ski accident. I think he's got a very interesting situation here because I, I do see a path that he could make the roster, um, but he's carrying a pretty hefty price tag and something there would have to change for me. Now, what I do find interesting here is for as awesome as James Cook was this year, the biggest the biggest thing that I saw out of him that's concerning is, you know, he had three, four drops that would have been like walk-in touchdowns, um, some of them in bigger moments than others. Um, what did we originally bring Hines in for and never really use him for? Being a pass catching back. Um, so I, I think the paths of the roster for me, since he would kind of have such a specialized role on offense, we we saw James Cook kind of have the ability to be this, you know, bell cow back for what our system looks like. Um, but I think there is a path to the roster for Hines in that we had Deontay Hardy um, in charge of return duties this year, and he kind of has a similar situation to Hines where I think he was effective on special teams but didn't really provide much on the on the offensive side of the ball, and he also has a pretty decent-sized contract. Um, that we can get out of pretty pretty easily. Um, so we'll get into that more as we move into the receivers. But for me, I'm okay with one of them staying. I honestly don't really care which. I think they were both electric in the special teams. Um, but I don't see a path to keeping both of those guys on the roster. Um, and then... Guys that were on the team and are now free agents, we had Latavius Murray, um, had Damian Harris. We never really got to see much of this year. Obviously had a a pretty scary-looking injury. Um, And then we had Leonard Fournette stop by for a cup of coffee. And um, somebody that was signed to a futures deal, he was here in the preseason, was Darrington Evans and... And he's a guy that I'm excited to have on the practice squad, um, but I don't think he's, I don't think he's like the next answer on the 53 man roster. I would have interest in bringing back Ty Johnson. Um, I thought he played really well in moments this year, and he's a dude I was really excited to to add. I was kind of surprised that the Jets just kind of let him walk and. You know, their their move was to replace him with Delvin Cook, who never really got any run. And, you know, I know they kind of had a loaded room with Reese Hall and Michael Carter was there and kind of a numbers game. But I always kind of liked Ty Johnson when he was with the Jets playing against the Bills, and I was excited to bring him in. Uh, it kind of took him, him a while to get opportunities on this team, but when he did, I thought he ran super hard. You know, a very different style running back than than James Cook is. But I thought he did a good job catching some passes. I thought he was a really effective runner in spots. And, you know, looking at some stat sheets, you're not going to... You know, he's not setting any records. Um, but I thought the usage that we got from him, he was a very valuable pickup. Um, as far as some of the other guys go... I said I, I would love to have Ty Johnson back at the right number. Um, I don't think he's going to be demanding any huge contracts out there. Um, so I would love to see him back in the building. Um, Latavius Murray was tremendous for about half a season. Um, towards the end of the season, you could tell he was... It looked like he was running out of juice. He also had some drop passes. Um, he was a super fun story for a while, and I think down the stretch kind of showed it, it's it's a spot where we can improve. Um, and then Damian Harris, I hate to say it because I, I was 
significantly more excited about him coming into the building than Murray. Um, and, you know, the way that his season ended for him, you know, hate to see a guy kind of fall out of favor with the team in that way. Um, I was really excited for him coming in, but my concerns were he had an injury history. Um, of course, this was a very different injury than, you know, some of his previous injury history. Um, unfortunately, on, on a one-year deal, we didn't really get to see what he had uh, had to offer very much. And when he was playing in healthy, he was he was getting out snapped by Latavius Murray anyways. Um, this is another spot where I would love to see an investment, another late round pick. Give me, give me, you know, that thunder to James Cook's lightning. My, my biggest complaint with this running back room right now is despite everything we added and the dudes that we were trying out, um, we still didn't really have that short yardage back and, Listen, I I understand it's always going to be hard on third and one, fourth and one to want to give the ball to anybody but Josh Allen. Um, I don't know about you guys, but every time we were running that tush push and Josh jumping over the pile, all that, like, I love that we have a guy that can do it. I would love if we had a running back that could take some of those hits off off of him. Um, all kinds of things can happen in those pileups there, you know, from you know, somebody rolling up on his ankle, a shoulder goes into a knee, and all of a sudden we've lost our quarterback for the rest of the season. And it was all in efforts to pick up a fourth and one and, you know, a week six game because we don't have a running back that could do it. Um, so I think there's a ton of these guys that come out in the draft every year of just kind of like a uh, thumper, get downhill, you know, get the tough yardage and, I think it's the perf- perfect compliment to James Cook, and I think you found the harder piece of the running back room to get that electric, dynamic athlete that can also... Like, Cook showed this year that he's not just a speed guy that, you know, you got to get to the edge and all that. He was he was running between the tackles and still making people miss in the box, all that. Um, so I think that's the, the tricky piece of the puzzle to figure out, and, and you've done that. You have him on a rookie deal for a few more years. Now find his compliment that you can keep around for a while. And I don't, I don't want this to be a third round pick by any means, fifth, sixth, seventh round, late round guy. And um, maybe bring back Ty Johnson, bring in uh, one of these, one of these bargain bin free agents that we see every year. Um, There's going to be some names out there. Um, what I'm really hoping that we avoid all all off season is should the Bills draft a running back round one, and you know every high price free agent running back um, being linked to Buffalo. Uh, the media has shown that they love to do that. Uh, it, when you look at the needs chart, when it comes, you know, when you're looking at draft stuff and all that, um, just by a numbers game. You know, running back is going to be listed as a position of need for the Bills. Um, so I'm sure we're still going to hear a whole bunch of that nonsense. Um, yeah, to give me give me a low cost veteran, um, give me a late round draft pick. The only the only situation where I would be moderately interested in spending some sort of money, um, and this is always kind of like. This is like a Madden scenario I could cook up in my head. I don't I don't see it being a real thing, whatever. If Derrick Henry wanted to come for a reasonable deal, you know, he's getting towards the end of his year. Maybe he wants to chase a ring. Um, if he was willing to do like a shared backfield with Cook and you had those two dudes that you had to game, game plan for every week, sure, give me that. But I, I just don't think the number is going to be realistic. Um, even if he were to you know, do this like team friendly thing so he could chase a ring. Um, I think that gets thrown around very, very cavalier. Like, uh, I don't, I think, I think we overestimate how much 
players want the championship versus how much they want, you know, an extra $5 million in their bank account. And honestly, when I'm sitting on my couch, I can, you know, say these guys are crazy for not wanting to play with a team that'll get them a championship, blah, blah, blah. Um, put me in the actual situation. I could have an extra $5 million in my bank account. Um, money might talk. So for, for me, that would be kind of the one, um, the one scenario that I would cook up that I'd be interested in. Um, I guess another one I'll throw out there just because of how much I wanted it last year. Um, Jamal Williams went to New Orleans last year, um, had an injury early, but then, you know, kind of just with how some of the young players were playing, Kamara came back, um, just didn't get a ton of run there. And if that were to be a situation where they were to part ways and he became available again, that that would be somebody that I would want to take a look at. And what I think would be really interesting there is the NFL is very much a what have you done for me lately league. And, you know, despite him, I, I think two years ago with Detroit, he led the league in touchdowns. Um, you know, he did very little with New Orleans last year. Um, so that might be the type of guy that you could get, you know, in, in the bargain bin. Um, and that's the exact type of, you know, short yardage, goal line type of back that I'm talking about here. Um he will always remain on my wish list. I absolutely love him as a player. He's a great interview. He seems super fun, and I will always want him on my team. Um, so that one, that one's probably a little bit more out there. Um, realistically, you know, give me kind of a, a minimum investment, bolster up that room, get me somebody that can consistently convert third and one, fourth and one. <laughs> like I said, I love having... A quarterback that can do it and do it super well. There's going to be a point in Josh Allen's career where we super don't want him doing that all the time. Uh, so that's going to do it for tonight's episode. Uh, like I said, we're going to be going through position by position and just kind of assessing what's on the team, what could be leaving, um, and what I what I would like to see change with um, each room. Um and depending on the position group, it'll probably be, you know, somewhere between two, three, four positions. You know, some of them are a little bit thinner on numbers. Um, but we're going to work our way through the whole roster um, as we move into free agency leading up to the draft. Um, so make sure you uh, you don't miss any of those episodes. Uh, make sure you're checking out the website, wanderingbuff.com. Our producer, Jake, is doing some great work on, on the website. Um bunch of articles going up there's going to be even more as we move into free agency free agency wish lists um draft just a ton of ton of content during the off season um so make sure you're not missing any of that um and you've made it this far like i said do ask you that you like share subscribe and just check out some other shows on on the fan base network some great content coming out um and we appreciate all the support Um, But that is going to do it for this week. Like I said, look out for us coming out Wednesdays going forward. And as always, go Bills. Bills.